In today's episode of the David Robertson Podcast, I was lucky enough to speak to Richard, who allows me to call him Joe. And that's because I couldn't pronounce his name. He is an author of a couple of books, his latest Immigrant Psychology, Heart, Mind and Soul. And we had a really deep conversation about things that are lost when it comes to immigration and legal migration. It's complex. There's a lot of nuance to the subject. And often, myself included, I can come at it from a very standoffish place, uh, which ultimately is a place where debate and discussion stops. And so it was nice to be able to talk freely and openly and, and learn a bit. I hope you enjoy the episode. As always, I will put the links to the books in the description. And yeah, leave your comments. Let me know what you think. Thank you, as always, for listening. Hello, welcome to the David Watson podcast. And thank you very much for joining me. How are you? Doing very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. So uh, we're going to get into the um, conversation about your latest book and the book you wrote previously. Do you just, for the benefit of people listening, just give a little background on yourself? Okay. Uh, I was born in Berlin, Germany, and I spent the first 10 years of my life in Germany, first in Berlin and then in another university town called Marburg. Uh, which was in the West Germany, well, what was called West Germany at the time. Uh, then my father, who had some expertise in electron microscopy, was essentially imported to an oceanography institute here in La Jolla in San Diego. And uh, so we, we came with him, uh, stayed, and I, since that time I have basically lived near the U.S.-Mexico border for my entire adult life, except for a couple of years in the Midwest. And that's included Texas and New Mexico, sometimes in California. Uh, so a lot of the things that you hear, stories that you hear these days about uh, immigrant uh, migrations coming up to the U.S. border in places like Eagle Pass, like El Paso, like San Diego, uh, I've lived in those places or have relatives in those places that experience that on the ground. Uh, professionally, I'm a psychologist and I've spent a uh, certain number of years in private practice uh, where I am also now. And in addition, I spent uh, some years working for local government in San Diego and also was a public health researcher at San Diego State University at the Graduate School of Public Health. So that's, in a nutshell, that's kind of what I've been up to. So taking that, that history in the background, what prompted you to write your books? I felt when I was watching, you know, media presentations, news presentations on immigrants, that there were some things often missing uh, from the public discourse that uh, people in academia have been talking about about for years and in clinical practice have been talking about for years and i do understand that a lot of you know professional research articles don't really make it into the down-to-earth real world so i wanted to do some transition of some of the things we know from a professional perspective about immigrants and how things operate uh, to where it's more accessible to the general public and that includes immigrants themselves, people who work with immigrants. It could be, you know, community-based organization folks. It could be immigrant attorneys. It could be, uh, you know, local government. And anybody who's really interested in a kind of a nuanced approach to the topic. And so, yeah, we've, we've been... I'm going to say we because uh, my wife and co-author, a fellow psychologist, and... Uh, and, and also somebody who's, who's lived in the border all of her life um, is, you know, is part of this book. And so we got together and said, okay, do, is there something that we want to do that, that gets some information that we've been sitting on uh, to the public? And that prompted, you know, the series of books that we're talking about. 
Okay. It's, 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 it's something that's highly politicized. And one of the things I know, so in, in, in the UK, um, for the whole of Europe at the moment, immigration is a huge problem. And and I don't mean problem with people coming in or people leaving. I'm not on about the illegal migrants. Trying to have a conversation about what we do is a huge problem. Whether or not it's unsustainable levels, whether the levels are sustainable, whether there's better ways to do it or not do it, I couldn't tell you because we're not allowed to have a conversation about it or every kind of conversation we have is is shut down to some capacity and what what's unique and i i genuinely don't know how much this would correlate with the us but what's unique is each country even the, the countries uh that are tied with the eu are all having their own unique problems and they're all handling them differently while it's supposed to be under the same umbrella and even though the uk left the eu we're still tied in to the same agreements so we're, we're kind of caught between different politics different policies but no conversation so there's no conversation about how you you move it forward did you have that same problem uh, with america we do because certainly in America, given the particularly the uh, recent events at the southern border, as you say, the the issue of immigration has become highly politicized. And I think honestly, I try to stay away from politics because yeah. my idea is to present kind of factual information or this information that's based on credible sources. And that looks not only at the U.S., but also looks at Europe, since originally that's where I'm from, and, and the, you know, so the EU, the U.K., and, and places that tend to be destinations for many immigrants and see what's going on. So we try to have an international perspective. And in fact, I have the books out in, in German, Arabic, and Spanish, as well as in English, just to be able to hit that. Yeah. Uh, I do think that the the political situation which tends to see things or at least present things in black and white in a lot of cases uh, misses the, the nuances that we really need to think about and I understand having the conversation about that is difficult because everybody is kind of in their corners politically these days. Uh, there's something in psychology called confirmation bias which in plain English basically means you pay attention to the stuff that confirms your preconceived notions and you ignore stuff that doesn't. And yeah. so that's not helpful in terms of getting the, the kind of broader perspective. Uh, and so we're, we're kind of pushing against the tide in some ways with these kind of books, but we do think it's important to have a more comprehensive conversation, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing. No, no, I agree. I agree completely. You know, I have very mixed feelings um, about immigration. I'm actually half Irish. My mum is Irish, and her family emigrated to the UK. Uh, half my, you know, several of my grand grandparents' family emigrated to America and Australia. So it, it's kind of like I am a product, like yourself, of immigration. Do you know? What I mean? So it's, it's it's difficult. It's a difficult because there's pros and cons and. Like, like, I mean, I think you probably worded it perfectly when you said there's nuances to this. And with those nuances um, comes uh, a, another level of understanding. And that is often what's missed when it comes down to two people shouting at each other via the media. So where would you start with the nuances to help people understand? Okay, so I think that one of the things I try to emphasize is that uh, we need to look at fairly broad trends that tend to be consistent over time. And in, in what we get uh, locally is a lot of, you know, oh my God, how many people are at the border? And that's includes in San Diego and my old hometown of El Paso, so I get that. Uh, but if we look at things over time in a more universal way, both in Europe and uh, when I looked up statistics for this in order to write the book, I was I kind of had a sense that this was the case, but I didn't know it was going to be confirmed as much as it was by real stats, uh, that immigration does uh, contribute 
uh, to the economic growth of the receiving country in a way that's very tangible. Now, people who come from maybe war-torn uh, places uh, will need a little bit more help in order to get started. But there is uh, light at the end of the tunnel, and there is a, a benefit that isn't just about, well, we need to be nice to immigrants, but there's actually something for us, too. That said, uh, I also understand that uh, when you look at the waves of migrations that have been occurring recently at the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, yeah, there any you can eat too much con cotton candy, and that's not a good thing. You know, yeah. so even a good thing if it's overwhelming, it's not viable. So we have to be able to keep both of those perspectives, but then. Uh, what we also looked at, again, it, it varies a little bit from country to country, but uh, both in Europe and in the States, uh, are there really, quote, criminals running across the border? Uh, not any more than we already have in the U.S. to begin with. In other words, there's not this uptick of, of crime uh, that, uh, that's occurring based on immigration. Now, there are, there are instances, uh, for example, uh, we have a, a, a family, my wife's relatives, who live in Eagle Pass, Texas, and uh, they reported to us that there was a <clears throat> polite but nevertheless armed uh, guy who came in, and he was very apologetic, and he was hanging out, hiding out from the from immigration folks. Uh, so that's a real thing. It, they weren't hurt. You know, they had a conversation with the guy. He left. Uh, but we understand that that's a real thing, and we're not ignoring that. But we're also looking at more global trends in terms of, you know, how to do this. And uh, I think we can learn from other cultures not to accept other cultures' norms whole hog and automatically. But, uh, yeah, in psychology, we say we don't want to have our clients play their instrument on one string. And so learning stuff about other cultures allows us to have a couple more strings. Now, this is not a way to uh, somehow buy into people who oppress other folks or advocate violence. So it's not this automatically across the board, everything's culturally relative and therefore okay. Uh, it's more of a, there are nuggets of, of possibilities in other cultures. And if we can mine those, they may be helpful. How do you, how would you approach more keys in people's fears? We tend to look at uh, a lot of situations as a zero sum game. So the zero sum game is basically whatever you get, I don't, and whatever I get that you don't. You know, so if 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 I let somebody in or I, I somebody invades my territory, so to speak, then suddenly they're a danger to me because bad things are going to happen. I'm going to miss out. They're going to take my jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I'm much more on the end of how can we increase the pie as opposed to there are only so many pieces to the pie, and if you grab mine, then I'm going to be in trouble. Uh, so then we have evidence to say that that's, that's actually the case, uh, that, uh, that uh, people are doing jobs that, are, that benefit not only them, but benefit us as well, so that if we look at this, let's say from an employer's perspective or from a broader societal perspective, uh, immigration and immigrants can drive the economic engine of a country in a way that, you know, we all win at the end of the day. So I think that alleviates the fear a little bit from, uh, oh, my God, they're going to take my job. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. We have this. Um, I, I try to always focus on when when there's difficult conversations. I, I always try to focus on the outcome. So I, you know, it's what what is the outcome we're actually trying to achieve? And in conversations I've had with 
friends around immigration because it is a very toxic situation to talk about is being the riots in dublin a couple of nights ago and you know that that as a result of a stabbing and i don't even know and that one's really strange i'm not if you're sure if you're aware of it um there was a, a mother and some children were stabbed it was actually a brazilian immigrant that tackled the guy and stopped it so it's this kind of you know he's just like hang on a second you know it wasn't an Irish person, you know, and I say that as somebody who's half Irish, you know, um, and, and we have this thing in the UK and I'm somebody that uh, runs a care team and actually several of the people I employ are immigrants. They're from Africa, well, you know, various countries in Africa, from Zimbabwe to South Africa to Nigeria, and, and I have some Eastern Europeans. So it's, it's a very difficult argument for me to go against, seeing it one time or another, half the people on my team were immigrants. You know, they weren't born in Britain. English is their second language. So, you know, they all came here as adults. And so when I try to break it down, the and I don't know if this applies to America, the frustration seems to be the focus on a tiny percentage of people that are reckless with the law and the privileges that you would get come into say the united states in terms of how you might be treated in terms of justice welfare etc that you wouldn't get in your own country or the country that you've fled from and this is particularly true um when you come to anywhere the eu or europe uh, or the uk and we are then tied up in the fact we can't deport them so when i have a conversation with people pretty much everybody i know knows an immigrant has a migrant as a friend a neighbor or works with them so they're only really complaining about the ones that have broken the laws and we're now in the uk especially we're now tied down to there's always a human rights reason why we can't deport them back to where whatever country they came from so it then creates a fear of a lawlessness control as long as you're an Im immigrant you can do what you want which just which isn't really the case but it's a very easy case to present yes and okay so that is it a criminal element uh, are, are the undocumented folks criminals technically yes but i can kind of understand how they got to where they got to and i'm 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 not just taking this from a a very liberal perspective. I'm taking it from a perspective of having worked basically side by side mm. with law enforcement in in San Diego for over ten years. So you know, counterterrorism was an interest of mine at one point. So I'm again, I'm trying yeah. to to balance things out a little bit, and so uh, I can understand the desperation that some people, let's say, that are coming up from. Uh, what's called the northern triangle basically central america and and venezuela and so on where they're basically sold a bill of goods by the the smugglers yeah. oh it's going to be easy and they're going to welcome you with open arms and then you you end up in a place called the darien gap which is a 60 miles of jungle uh in you know central america uh with snakes and other critters and uh mud and everything else that I don't think I could handle at my age and yet people do it and then you get uh, through Mexico on the top of a train that's called La Bestia which translates into the beast and there's a good reason for that because people sit on top of the freight train uh, it rumbles through the, the, the night people fall asleep they roll off they're gone that doesn't even start to count the human trafficking, the sex trafficking, the, all the other stuff. So after you get through all that mess, which, and like I said, I'm not sure I could make it, uh, then you get to the U.S.-Mexico border where you've been told you're going to be welcomed with open arms. And that's certainly not the case. Uh, there's pretty strict laws around uh, asylum, and so on, uh, and who can get in and go out. And, and we have become overwhelmed with that system. And then people are sitting at the border and decide to climb the fence, uh, which is 
oftentimes not healthy for them either. And then they end up undocumented, which is, uh, again, I can understand where people are coming from in that kind of situation, but I can also understand that we need to have a legal process that, that is uh, spun up enough to be both fair, but also, uh, you know, it's, there are clear rules and, and some, not everybody's going to get in just because they're yeah. there. Yeah. It was interesting. It was, I was going to say something about the UK. It was interesting. We were over there at a lawyers conference, international lawyers conference a couple of years ago. Uh, we're not lawyers, but we decided to show up because it was an immigration conference. And part of the, the issue with people in the UK was that they were coming in, uh, not as foreigners, but there were ISIS people coming in mm. with UK passports. So you know, you had not only yeah. uh, immigrants from other countries, but had citizens who had been radicalized that were were concerned. Yeah, because one of the things we, as a country, and Europe is the same, because we're all signed up to the European Court of Human Rights, and effectively, if, if somebody claims asylum, you're not allowed to reject them. So that e even whilst they're being processed, if they break the law, if, you know, because bearing in mind we had 600,000 immigrants just to the UK last year, we didn't have 600,000 criminal charges, do you know what I mean? So, you know, so you're talking about a tiny percentage, but that's the noise. And you will get, you know, you, know, you can have 600,000 Midwest Christian people one of them, there's going to be some bad apples, you know, doesn't, you know, doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what your culture is, you know, that when you start talking to those vast numbers, there's always some bad people. Um, but what happens is the noise is because of the, partly because, of, you know, these things are very complex because of human rights act, we're not allowed to deport them. Well, they have to stay in the UK because they've claimed or somewhere in the EU within the European union because of their um the refugee status to the point that sometimes we're not yeah it, it there's a sense of powerlessness which i suspect if you were able to talk to the actual people it's not we're not as powerless as it seems to be but there is a lot of human rights lawyers who go to great lengths to block the government from deporting people who have broken the laws or have come here illegally and the problem with that is we are plowing a huge amount of resources which is kind of what i was referring to at the beginning huge amount of resources into arguing about the problem and there's no resources being spent on how do we solve the problem what's the outcome we're looking for and the outcome that i, I would hope that we're all looking for is similar to what you were just saying we need a, a process that can be spun quickly where some people we will be able to allow in, some people will be eligible, and some people I'm ever so sorry, but you're not going to be allowed in. So how do we help you safely get to somewhere else? Right, right. So actually, uh, well, unpacking the, the asylum scenario, uh, the system, this a combination of things. There was, you know, tons of courts were backed up due to COVID, so that's one issue. No, uh, uh, the migrant caravan population coming to the border in the greatest numbers we've seen in a while is another issue. So those things kind of collide and you have a, a super backed up system in the asylum process, which uh, sometimes results in people being essentially led into the country and on the street, uh, and one of these days you're going to have your hearing, but we don't really know when. That can be, you know, quite a time. Uh, and I understand that's an issue, but you know, I, I guess I'd rather have that than people languishing in jails because we know how that turned out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for uh, sure. For sure. Having having said that, the asylum process. Well, there are a couple of things. Uh, Number one, resources have to be put into, federal resources have to be put into the, the court system there because the, somehow the backup needs to be dealt with. I know they've increased the number of judges. I'm not so sure of what I'm hearing on the ground that they've increased the 
the other personnel that's needed in order to make that happen as well. So, but that that system needs to be spun up. Uh, but I will say, from the standpoint of having testified as a psychologist in a couple of asylum uh, hearings when I was doing some work for Survivors of Torture International, uh, getting asylum is not an easy thing. In fact, unless you have an attorney, a great number of people are rejected. And part of that is, well, prove that you are, you know, in the situation you are. Where's your documentation? Well, I got out of touch real quick and, you know, I, I didn't think about bringing in all my paperwork. So now you have to prove that you, you really need asylum in a situation uh, where you had to run out of town because of the very reason that you came here, because you, you, you were running for your life. So it's kind of a catch-22. And, and it's probably worthwhile as well, and I imagine you have a great insight to this, um, because you, you, you almost mentioned something earlier about the way they travel to get here. You know, so, so we, they, they, before you, you know, we even worry about them trying to climb over a fence to get in, they have probably traveled a thousand miles, 500 miles, a thousand miles, possibly across a couple of countries. As you said on the promise that don't worry when you get there, it's going to be fine. There was it the beast you called it? The, the train yeah, is called, yeah, the train is called La Bestia in, in Spanish, which translates into the beast. It also has the name of the, the train of death. Train of death, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, which pretty much so, sums up. Yeah, so, so know, it probably doesn't have a first class carriage with Wi Fi. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's not even a commuter train, it's a, it's a freight train. So you don't get a seat, you have to sit on top of the, 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 the cars. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to sort of, from that description, you're not exactly going to be hydrated. You're probably going to be suffering some close forms of malnutrition. If you're hanging on a roof, you're probably cold, hypothermic, you know, depending on the weather and the conditions and how long you've been on this train. The Setting aside the physical condition, there must the mental. I mean, what, 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 actually, I won't set aside the physical condition because that will always play a part in the mental condition. But ge generally, look, as a psychologist, how would you describe, you know, to give people an idea of how? I'm trying to. I'm just. I'm starting to sound very clumsy. What I'm trying to kind of get to is, I want people to understand what these people are trying to achieve and the conditions that they end up in by the time they get to the point of i'm now at a border waiting to come to america because the belief is they're going to be uh, welcomed with open arms but there's going to be a physical and mental toll that people just won't appreciate so yeah i think there's a there's a clear physical element there's also a psychological element the two go hand in hand we've managed to divide things out in western culture to some degree but they're really one integrated whole so you have people who have been under a <clears throat> significant physical strain for an extended period of time <clears throat> walking 60 miles is not an easy task uh, and that's just the beginning of the road so to speak uh, that's going to take, um, depending on age and your physical shape to begin with, that's going to be uh, a problem. Uh, infections that you may catch along the way um, could be a problem. And so, you know, healthcare is essentially a non-starter if you're on that kind of, of trip. Uh, I've, I've heard stories of people who were pregnant who were trying to make that, that trip. So, the the physical strain is obvious and p and by the time people get to the border they do need some some real care and attention uh that's the kind of the tip of the iceberg the other piece is the psychological scenario because uh, smugglers are not necessarily your friends uh they're trying to take your money you're, they're trying to exploit you in every which way they can uh, both in signing you up for this little adventure and what happens to you along the way. Uh, human trafficking, assault, sex trafficking is just, you know, it's a routine part of the equation, unfortunately. Uh, and, you know, on top of all of that, uh, I know 
It's been documented by some reporters who've actually gone along on the trip through the Darien Gap, uh, where there are literally the remains of people who didn't make it along the way. You know, that's a real thing. Uh, so you get all of that and you get here, and uh, chances are you're going to need some help, uh, both in terms of just basic medical needs and oftentimes psychological needs, uh, trauma-related disturbances, and so on. Uh, Having said that, I'm also uh, amazed at the resilience that some of these folks have. Uh, and in, in some way that maybe, uh, well, there's a cultural context to that. There's something called the immigrant paradox, where immigrants, despite low second socioeconomic circumstances and so on, seem to be doing better than some of the local population. So how does that make sense? Because... Uh, one would think the opposite is true. But they have uh, a cultural context, they have a certain dietary habit, and so on, that, uh, that allows them to get support from maybe family members who've gotten with them, uh, from their belief system, and so on. So I have to not just say, okay, well, everybody's going to be really messed up by the time they get here. But... Uh, a lot of people are also very powerfully resilient, and there's a real strength to that that I have to acknowledge and appreciate. Uh, because again, when if people are uh, allowed to enter and then are able to make a life here, that certainly again works in our favor as well as their favor in terms of having that as part of the equation in the country. Well, how does somebody who is from how, how does the process start? What, what's the thought process you know, that gets them on that journey to becoming to try and get into America? No. Well, I, I'll use my uh, some examples from my clinical practice, uh, and this is not as much of a current scenario, but I've seen I used to be. Uh, the board chair for a local organization called Somali Family Service of San Diego. And I, that happened because I was doing a needs assessment with San Diego State University in combination with the, with the Islamic Center of San Diego. We had a joint grant. And so we did a needs assessment that turned into uh, a senior with Somali Family Service and that turned into uh, clinical patients uh, who supposedly from that population who are supposedly never going to go to somebody like me because it's a cultural taboo. But, you know, if the mom says you're okay, then they come in anyway. And so mm -hmm. for a long time, I, my practice was like 60% Somali refugees. So this is the story from them that I heard, heard over and over again. Uh, and it's, that probably has its equivalents in other parts of, of the world. Uh, so the the bar regime was turned upside down in 1991. There was a big upheaval in in, uh, in Somalia. People who used to be kind of on the top of things were now considered on the bottom. There was a lot of revenge going on and so on. And so the standard scenario is somebody comes to your house. You're not political. You're just, you know, you're just trying to live and just have a normal life. Uh, they come to your house. They seems to be a protocol that they have to kill at least somebody. Uh, there's usually rape involved, sometimes of children. And uh, you get the clear message if you survive that incident, you get the clear message that you better get out of town, okay? Because you're not, they're gonna come back. Uh, it's not gonna be safe for you. So then the, the options are basically two, you go to a refugee camp in Kenya, or you go to a refugee camp in Ethiopia. And you may get some medical care there from the Red Crescent or the UN, or that kind of thing. And, but it's, it's rudimentary at best on the physical end, and th there's no psychological services I'm aware of in that, that whole deal. Uh, if you're fortunate, then you get to the United States. And uh, after sometimes I've had people who spent like eight years in a, in a subsistence diet and, and just really 
nasty refugee camp where the local population, particularly the authorities, are also hitting you up for money and, and other things. Uh, and you're not, you don't have the power to do anything about that, really. So then you get to the States, and uh, again, it's the, the Office of Refugee Resettlement uh, for people who've been formally accepted as refugees actually has a reasonable, I think, program that we can learn from of distributing migrants in the U.S. based on a formula that includes you know, oc occupational opportunities and, and a lot of other factors. So it's not a, you know, a political stunt busing kind of scenario. It's more of a thought out process. Uh, now it's, I don't know what's going on in Germany these days. We, we had a friend at one time who used to be a police officer in Germany. And he told us that, that there is a similar system in Germany, but it, it people have to stay. In other words, that's part of the deal. If we send you to Düsseldorf, you stay in Düsseldorf. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., if you want to move, you can. And so uh, I've had clients come in and I asked them, you know, where were you re most recently in terms of where you lived outside San Diego? I'm expecting Mogadishu or whatever. They're saying Kansas and Montana. <laughs> so <laughs> how did that happen? You know, that was not the answer I was expecting, but it's because they were placed there. And and so this kind of more nuanced distribution system uh, based on real factors that might actually lead to some success is, is worth thinking about. Yeah, I, I am familiar with the fact we still have it in the UK. When you process, you get told where you're going and you're, you're not moving from there. Um, I'm not, yeah, I had a friend who worked in probation services and he used to deal with a lot of immigrants and, um, yeah, they're, they're very, they're quite, they're very strict on it. You, you go where we tell you to go. Um, and I think it's due to security reasons because we do sometimes get, um, sort of is uh, Islamist and ISIS wanting to go to particular mosques. And they're told, like, no, no, you, you, you're not going to that area of, of England. But again, the, the, the problem with that is that will probably be one person out of every thousand. You know, so it, it's kind of, again, it, it, it's always the negative you hear and not the positive. Yeah. So, I mean, again, it, we don't want to minimize uh, a potential threat if there actually is one. Mm. And and it's, I think it's it's extremely isolated but the problem is that uh, uh terrorists are what sometimes referred to as force multipliers which basically means one guy can get things going in a really horrible way it only takes one or two and you know yeah. you got what you got. uh i don't have you know a lot of information about how people are received at mosques across the united states but uh, locally here we the the biggest islamic center of san diego which is basically the place where everybody goes from all kinds of different populations is is really kind of forward thinking and how they do things uh they're involved in interfaith activities and so on so uh i'm not sure advocating for blowing stuff up would go over yeah. with certainly mom and and other people at the mosque that i'm i'm aware of uh believe it or not they sent my wife and i a christmas card at one time yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you know there's this, there's a certain we have our faith and we that's what we believe and you know that's we're not going to change that but we also understand that we're not the only ones in the world and and we have some respect for uh for other populations and uh, i think i appreciate it i wish i still had it I, one of these days i'm going to have to look through all the closets and find my yeah. my christmas cards from the islamic center so as, as somebody that has, has a, a, a depth of knowledge to this what are the positives i think that the the basic resilience is is one thing Okay. I think after people have made this kind of journey and would, you know, I had it easy. We were basically imported. Yeah. Uh, 
was no there was no no barrier it's just come on in we need your skills particularly my dad's skill and the family kind of came along but we're and that's certainly still a thing where there are visa types that allow for certain uh yeah. people who've accomplished uh, a whole lot of stuff uh to, to basically be invited in uh but i tend to focus in my books on even though i acknowledge that and it's part of my own background i tend to focus on the people who have some of the greatest needs right and uh because of the the kind of journeys that they have uh and i can't overemphasize the their willingness to to kind of oftentimes start at the bottom even if they're highly educated people back home i have a friend who was an md in uh pakistan uh, i mean in afghanistan uh, trained in india who basically went back to school got what amounts to a second doctorate and is now a practicing physician again but imagine if you're coming in and you're mid career physician from some place else and then suddenly you're required to basically do your education all over again uh so it's it's not just the field workers it's even though they're an important part of the equation it's also uh people from all kinds of economic circumstances back home that that we think about and in order to be able to do that and you know if i have to start at the bottom you know what i'm going to start at the bottom and that doesn't mean i and or my children are going to remain there but uh i'll do whatever it takes to to make stuff happen for my family and my prodigy and so on so i think that's a certain strength that that i also respect uh there i don't remember his name but there was a recent movie here in the united states called uh, like a thousand miles high or something like that but basically the bottom line was that it was the story of a of a field worker family who his child had particularly uh notable talent in mathematics who actually became an astronaut very good and so yeah if you remember that, i don't know if you saw that or have heard about that movie uh, yeah but the line i like is and i can't quote it directly out of memory but the, the the gist of it was that uh who better to go into space than a migrant you know yeah, we've yeah. already we've already been all, over a whole lot of territory you know going into orbit is just one more step we were experts at this so yeah where other people are worried about making 100,000 dollar salaries and are somewhat unhappy if that doesn't happen particularly in California because that's what it takes to live uh yeah you know, uh the willingness to really really work hard and to start at the bottom no matter what your background is and to put in the time and to put in the effort and to put in the work and claw your way up uh and and kind of do it right in some ways the american dream uh, yeah. that benefits us because work gets done uh, everybody benefits and uh yeah we come out ahead so what helps them when they get here i'm sorry say again what helps them prosper what helps an immigrant prosper i think what helps them uh it's a certain mindset you know and uh this is an unfortunate example but we we did some uh research that had to do with people who have been formally tortured mm. and if you look at let's say you look at post traumatic stress disorder yeah uh uh the the obvious thing is that the more trauma you've had the more symptoms you're going to have that kind of makes common sense in fact there's something called a uh, complex PTSD which is based on multiple traumas rather than one that's not recognized in the diagnostics yet but it it should be in this research certainly to back up the concept so bottom line more trauma more symptoms more dysfunctions makes sense and we were getting that in our sample across the board except for one population 
And that one population was the people who had been systematically tortured in this case, oftentimes by uh, the Ba'ath Party, you know, uh, Saddam Hussein's deal yeah. before the war there. And, and somehow they bucked the trend. Uh, they were actually more resilient and, and had less difficulties than some of the other folks who, even though the other folks also had bad experiences, but not at the level of, of uh, getting officially tortured. But I mean by that is when you listen to the stories, basically there is kind of a, somebody went for, to school for this stuff and learned this. There's a very organized way of, of uh, sensory deprivation and physical harm and so on that, 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 uh, you know, somebody I think went to school for. Uh, so then why was there such a, such a difference in that particular group? And uh, part of our conclusion was we don't have that in terms of, you know, formal uh, data in the study, but I think probably, unfortunately, the people that we saw were the people that made it through, okay? Right. And not everybody makes it through. That's an so, important yeah. distinction to understand. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, like I said, uh, it's not that extreme, maybe in some of the other immigrant stories, but uh, the people we get, are, we get are the people that made it through. And uh, yeah, yeah that, that's something to sit on and reflect on, because that's quite an important statement, because like you say, it's you, you're seeing this, for want of a better term, survivors, yeah. and which you know, yeah, because I can imagine when when you're there and you you're processing, you're you're trying to join the dots up to understand a conclusion of what's happening, what's not happening, and suddenly you get that realization of, oh, you you were kind of strong enough to survive. And, I mean, if you look at the immigrant of migration, you and uh, organization that has you know chapters all over the world. Uh, they have a missing migrant program, and you know basically what they're looking at. You're not going to get complete numbers because a lot of things are unknown. But what we do know is that let's say uh, people coming from Africa and, and so on, there are a whole lot of people who are lost at sea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's some some effort then to hook them up with another organization that helps them uh, connect with living relatives and so on. But the IOM OM data is pretty significant in terms of the missing migrant program, uh, program in terms of how many people have been lost. Uh, and I, I think at the time that there was the uh, the many sub disaster of the people who went down to the titanic and, and and not taking anything away from that that was a bad experience that yeah. shouldn't have happened and i feel badly for the family of the of the people who, who lost their lives there but at the same time there was a ship off of greece that what six seven hundred people went down uh you know so that, that kind of puts things into perspective yeah, what can it does. Yeah. it's what if 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 you were able how would you either change policy adapt at the current institutions to to come to let, let, what would be a satisfactory conclusion and then from like if if you look at the outcome is the, the satisfactory conclusion which may mean that people get rejected but how would you change policy or the institutions to enable something to actually happen and make a difference well how many hours do we have but <laughs> i'll try to make it as, as succinct as i can uh i do think we uh, we need to reach out to people who are thinking about migrating. Let's let's take one example, which is Venezuela and the, the Northern yep. Triangle, which is the Central um, American states, who are basically given a, you know, take, we'll take your money, but we'll, we'll, we'll help you get there and we'll do all the good things for you. Okay, that's, that's, oh, I understand that's the sales wrap, but there needs to be a reality check 
at the location in terms of what's really going on and how difficult it really is. Uh, there, there are actually a few reports, I don't know what the numbers are, but there are a few reports who, of people who are living in the street right now and saying, well, this is worse when, than when I came, and so uh, I want to go back. So what's realistically uh, the idea that, that you're not going to be able to uh, do this journey and kind of you're not getting on a jet plane and landing at San Diego, San Diego International Airport. Uh, uh, so if we have that down, I think then the second thing is that, yeah, we need to really, as we've talked about before, is spin up the immigration system so it can handle the numbers. And that's going to take some money. That's a reality. But, uh, you know, what other options do we have? Uh, and that includes the court systems. And there are then there are local organizations that have been impacted by COVID, uh, but that are also, uh, I think, still trying to make a difference. For example, in San Diego, we have something called Welcoming San Diego, which is a is a coordinated effort by local government, industry, and other uh, stakeholders to provide for those people who are here legally uh provide some support on you know both on the economic side and the employment side and the health side and so on uh, to be successful uh, i think i i i would certainly encourage uh a system that ORR already has, Office of Refugee Resettlement already has, that says, okay, you know, let's, for those people who have relatives in the U.S. already or wherever they're, you know, uh, if they're in another country, uh, then that's an obvious destination, but uh, let's have a systematic way of being able to uh, find places for immigrants coming in that don't have family members and that are here legitimately uh, so that can get the best start possible. Uh, I was thinking of something else, uh, which I know had, you know, has escaped me. So I'll, I'll get back to it later if we have time. Oh, I, I, go ahead. No, please finish, please. Uh, I think that uh, we really need to. Uh, think about what COVID has taught us. And what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, when it's hit the fan, suddenly uh, some of the institutional and governmental barriers that kept, uh, let's say, physicians and other healthcare workers and other kinds of folks from being able to practice their, to their ability, uh, suddenly that went Oh, and we need foreign doctors. We don't care. We don't have enough doctors. So let's let's suspend all the rules for a while. And uh, that is something that actually I think worked. I think uh, I'm not aware of any numbers that say that the foreign doctors were sued more frequently than the, you know, that the, the mm -hmm. homegrown doctors, anything like that. And it can be argued that they probably saved a lot of lives. Uh, so I think we need to learn from that. There's, there are national politics. There are also statewide politics about, you know, who can practice and who can't and what the rules are around. And we like people from here, but we think people from here are substandard. And some of this is not based on real information. It's more of a, it's more of a political thing than it's a, it's a practical real world thing. And what, like I said, when it hits the fan, suddenly that goes out the window because now we have a need and we're in dire straits. And if we can not go back to our old way of being, but we can understand that people who have skills that come in the country may be of value to us in certain even higher level occupations, then we need to be able to have systems that allow that to happen. Uh, we actually got... Uh, information uh, not that long ago from somebody who lives in Tijuana in Mexico across the border from us who said, by the way, do you know that uh, the Germans are recruiting healthcare workers in TJ? I said, really? That's happening? Uh, and I looked, I looked it up and yes, that's true, you know, and, and they certainly have institutional barriers in Germany as well, but uh, 
Here there were a bunch of folks being recruited from, from Mexico to be healthcare workers in, in, in Europe. So yeah, maybe we can learn something from that. There's something called the Global Skills Partnership. You can look it up on online. And I don't know how well it's doing on the ground, but it has an interesting concept in terms of being able to uh, smooth some of these cross-border uh, issues uh, and around licensing and qualifications and so on to where training actually happens, I think, in the model uh, that allows people to uh, learn something about the other you know, profession and the other culture of that profession before they go over so that it's a very smooth and integrative system of being able to make some of those global transitions happen in a, in a positive sort of way. When you were talking there and you mentioned something about COVID and it, it, setting aside politics and people's belief about COVID and vaccines and, and all of that, what was clear from when all of that was going on is there was a kind of global cooperation where in in one form or another most of the countries around the world even the ones that don't get on agreed on a process that needed to happen and as you were talking about um what we could do you, you suddenly realized that actually when it when it suits they can pull together and make decisions and actually there could just be if it was possible which, you know, which it could be if there was a will to do it and and a recognition for the need to do it there could just be a global policy that all countries sign up to and agree to like they did under the world health organization with covid and vaccines etc etc uh, actually this is how we're going to deal with refugees and if refugees come from your country, this is what we're going to expect from you. And this is how we're going to be expected to treat them and expected to behave in a certain way. And actually, these countries in between these borders, you need to actually take responsibility for stopping these things and allow a process to happen where there can be a global agreement on how migration happens and doesn't happen. And because, like you say, there'll be somebody somewhere who has maybe, maybe has an okay life. But they're being sold this idea that their dream is in another country across four borders, but it's going to cost you this much of your life savings. And maybe you can get your family to help us. And we're going to do this. And then along that route, you're going to be sold. You're going to be sex trafficked. You're going to be abused. You're going to be tortured. You might never make it. And then if you do make it, we might not let you in anyway. And right. like you said, people end up homeless and thinking, I wish I was actually home. And, and and literally it's just as you were saying about the covid and i was just like do you know what? we bloody f we bloody came together once before and decided on a way to do something that should help the rest of the world prosper and it's kind of a travesty that we're not doing it now well i think there's a certain sense that you know when the emergency over the rubber band snaps back to normal and and oh, okay well you know business as usual and mm. That's not serving us because uh, given economics and we are, you know, we are a global economy. That's just the reality of whether like it or not like it, be as isolationist as you want to be, but it's not going to change the picture. Uh, if we wanted to be isolationist, we probably would have some really significant economic detriment as a result of that decision. So given that, and given the amount of travel and so on, we are going to be uh, interconnected in ways that we haven't been before. And uh, some cooperation along those lines are just, that's just going to be necessary because COVID is not going to be the last pandemic. It, it, it's going to happen again. Hopefully not in my lifetime, but I'm 72, so I don't have that much time left. <laughs> you know, so, so uh, once was good enough for me, but I, you know, it's going to come up again. Uh, and so, if we're more prepared next time around, then then, you know, uh, it again, it's one of those things that benefits us all, but we're not always smart enough to recognize. Just to um, before before we finish. And I just have a couple of more questions. You just give 
the the names to both books i think it's probably important for people to realize there's two books that you've written and there's a third on the way i'm sorry i didn't catch the whole question then. um could, could you just let people know the the two books you've already written because you know oh, okay. You know, okay uh so the 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 short version of the title it has a subtitle but the short version of the of the first book is immigrant concepts and it's life path to integration and that is basically an overview of some of the things that immigrants tend to need when they come to a, a new country in order to be successful and again we're not just dealing with the united states we're trying to look at this globally in terms of europe and 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 the uh the uk and so on uh, so that includes acculturation and how you do that and what are the what are the different pathways that people take that includes resilience that includes economic uh, issues and uh, career development and how do you do that uh, with somebody let's say with a foreign education and so on uh, so it's it includes smaller sections on both health and mental health but the idea is that, that you have an overview book the second book is Immigrant Psychology, Heart, Mind, and Soul, and that focuses specifically on mental health. Uh, again, looking at both uh, the, the, the needs that some people have based on their experiences back home on the road and when they get to their new country, uh, but also the resilience, uh, what, you know, from somebody who's more of a professional, what are the diagnoses that tend to be uh, prevalent for that population versus some that are not so we don't want to over pathologize a population just because and uh then uh what do people come in with in terms of of then practical needs on the ground uh, and how can we best serve those populations in an effective sort of way in the healthcare community so you know what's culturally effective what are people's conceptions coming in that we are likely to encounter in the clinical world uh, and it also gives people who are immigrants an overview of some of the treatments that are around including how they may or may not fit with uh, what happens in other countries yeah. psychoanalysis is a big thing in some places in south america i didn't know that <laughs> you know but yeah. Yeah yeah so it's not like it's going to be a completely different thing uh the third book which is coming out i hope l later in in december hopefully mid-december is uh focuses more on the public health arena and that includes you know medications for example if you if you have a certain medical condition uh are you and you are on certain meds as a, as a traveler and as a permanent resident and even as a visitor uh, how are you able to translate those medications into uh, your new country's situation and laws? So, for example, you know, something that may be, uh, there's something called a uh, rehypnol, which is uh, benzodiazepine, which is basically a, a, an anti-anxiety drug, very powerful anti-anxiety drug is legal in many parts of the world but it's not legal for use in the united states um in fact it has a bad reputation as a as a date rape drug yeah so you know so how do you how are you able to negotiate those systems in order to transition healthcare from where you're from to where you end up uh in terms of just services that you think you're going to get uh medications that you may be used other treatments and so on and also how do local providers let's say in the united states understand the the circumstances that people come in with uh there for example there's a as a vaccine called the bcg vaccine which is used in various parts of the world uh for tb for tuberculosis which is still a big thing even though we had that supposedly under control at one time uh well it turns out the bcg a vaccine that's used in many parts of the world uh, prov provides a false positive on a TB PPD skin test. Oh. So somebody's going, oh my God, you got TB. And no, you don't. You had the vaccine. 
So then, you know, they work it out with, with x-rays and so on. But if you're going through a basic employment screening where the TB test is part of it and suddenly you come back positive, then for no good reason, then, you know, you yeah. have to, how do you negotiate that kind of stuff? And how do you, how providers learn what's happening in other parts of the world? Um, I just got another question before I finish. Um, if somebody listening to this and somebody who objects to any form of illegal migration, so, and that they will have a problem for every solution. So, you know, it doesn't matter what you say to them. They're going to be fearful. They're going to be worried about jobs, you know, crime and, 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 and all of that. So it's taken that the view that you're not going to be able to have a debate about the benefits or the potential benefits how would you like them to reflect on the human that's made the journey and like because you, you know sometimes when when you tr you think you're having an intellectual debate with somebody and you realize you've spent 45 minutes trying to win an argument with somebody that was never going to change their mind so what would you pose to them to see that person as a human so that they may actually come up with a solution themselves. Uh, in psychology, we know that uh, talking about things is one element and helping people kind of adjust to what they need to adjust to. But there's, I think there's nothing more powerful than modeling, which is why parents are such a big deal in raising kids talk all you want, but lead by example and, and, and learn by experience. So I would, I would ask anybody who's in the arena where, you know, uh, immigrants are streaming across the border, causing all kinds of havoc and crime and, uh, you know, and, and raising our murder rate through the roof. I, I would ask them to maybe get to know an actual immigrant, the human connection. Mm -hmm. And get to talk to that person, you know, human to human, uh, not to challenge their belief system, but just to understand them as individual people and, and uh, hear what they have to see, say, uh, think about what they're actually physically doing and how they're conducting their lives. And... Uh, and uh, try to learn from that uh, by having individual connection. Uh, oftentimes, the uh, you know if you if you look at politics, uh, I wouldn't be a big fan of the state of Texas. <laughs> However, I lived in Texas for twenty two years. Uh, Love the people was all over the state. You know, the heart of Texas is still in my heart. And uh, went to high school there. I graduated from college there. So, you know, it's a thing. And some of the pe many, many people I met in Texas were just uh, uh, the greatest people ever in my life. Yeah. Okay. So it's the individual human connection that uh, sometimes just transcends the politics. And you're going, wait, you know, somebody's uh, jibber jabbering over here. But I know so and so, and they're a really cool cat. Yeah. You know? So yeah, that starts a little dent in 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 how I see things, and I I can't dismiss, you know, somebody who is a buddy of mine, just because they live in a place that tends to have a certain political output. Okay. And my last question, which is completely random and it's off the cuff and not related to any <laughs> subject we've discussed today. <laughs> But it's a question I just like to ask everybody at the end. If you could, using the best of your imagination, um, if you could be any place in time, where would you be? Why would you be there? What car would you drive? And what music would you listen to? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I've seen a lot of historical documentaries and the sanitary conditions are not the best. Uh, so I'm not so sure that in history I that I would want to go to the Middle Ages or anything like that. 
uh, lots of wars that I was fortunate enough to duck. Uh, okay. At the same time, I have a lot of hope in the human race. And so, uh, and an avid reader of science fiction. And so I, I'd want to be somewhere in the future to see kind of how things turn out. Okay. Uh, uh, I think that would be my, my best answer that I can come up with. And what I would be doing there, I'm sure with uh, whatever psychological research we have these days would be way out of date and we'd be way ahead of the time, but I'd have to do a lot of catching up. But then I'd just be another immigrant who has to, you know, <laughs> who has to adapt to new environments. So I'm I'm still waiting for the flying car, okay. and uh, that it has more than propellers on it that actually has anti grav. So that would be a cool thing. Yeah. And what music would you listen to? Oh, okay. Now, I don't make this too public too often, but I spent uh, ten years as a professional musician before I ever. Uh, Six, four years of those were while I was going to college, and six years of those were in the Southwest, on the Midwest, on the road for pretty much all the time. Uh, like a lot of people at a certain age, I've kind of gotten stuck in the 60s and 70s and maybe some of the 80s in terms of the music that I like. Uh, I'm not crazy about some of the music that exists these days. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would love to see music go back to a point where this is, doesn't apply to everybody. I'm not making blanket statements, but, but as a whole, uh, music that's really well composed and that's, uh, you know, has a lot of thought into, into the song and so on, so that you have a kind of this carefully crafted and instrumented thing that you're putting out into the world. And, uh, I would hope things go back to that to some degree. At least we would have that as a as a way, just rather than repeating the same phrase over again, squatting and pointing at the audience. Doesn't do it for me. No, I'm with you I on that. One. that uh, yeah, I, it was interesting. I saw uh, saw, but I'm I'm not going to mention the artist's name. But I saw one thing like that at the. Uh, one of the concerts that was for, you know, 4th of July celebration. Okay. And, you know, so basically it was one, not all that impressive phrase over and over again, squatting and pointing the audience and saying it over and over again. Okay, fine. Uh, done with you, dude. Uh, and then Chicago came on in another concert, played some of the older songs and, you know, horn section, uh, carefully worked out song, multiple layers to it, approaching classical music and skill and style. Uh, I said, okay, yeah, there's a difference here. And I would love to see groups like that, uh, yeah. you know, get back on track. And, and now it's called prog rock, which it was not called in my day. You know, yeah, yeah. everybody has a lot more stuff now. Uh, but uh, there was a real kind of meaningful scenario that happened in the 60s and 70s where uh, music as a social media was a, a big deal mm. it still is to some degree but uh not to the degree it was back then now that's an old guy's perspective and other people are going to have their own ideas but you know as an ex-musician that's that's kind of where i'm coming from no i like that i like that and uh, i haven't seen it there's a film that came out. It's Philip Seymour Hoffman uh, before he died. Uh, it's called The Boat That Rocks. And if you haven't seen the film, I strongly recommend you look it up. You will love it. And the reason you will love it is it talks about the UK when the government wouldn't permit uh, music of a certain type in the 60s it wasn't permitted on radio so we had all these uh, pri uh, pirate radio stations hanging around the channel and it's about one of those i think it's uh, supposed to be radio caroline um but you'll like the music you'll like the culture and how they address uh, they tackled the british government and uh yeah it, it, it's called the boat of rocks and you'll love that film i guarantee it i'll have to check it out thank you Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you.
so far. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So there you go. Another episode of the David Watson podcast. I'm sure you'll agree. Immigration, it's complex. There's benefits, there's downsides. But ultimately, at the end, we're still talking about people. And whatever any of our personal feelings are, we do need to find a solution. Please, everyone, take care. Thank you for listening. If you have the heart to do it, like, subscribe, share, and maybe comment.